What is it about the American West that makes it so big and so haunted? Today, we speak with medium and author Sterling Moon, who shares stories from haunted saloons, spirit-inhabited row houses, and a community park where they removed the headstones, but not the bodies. In Colorado, Wyoming, and other places out west, have you ever seen some of the things Sterling has encountered? Listen and find out today on Homespun Hates. Hello, Hainted Loves. Welcome to Homespun Hates. I'm Becky. I'm Diana. And today on the show, we are so thrilled to bring on Sterling Moon. She is a medium, she is a tarot reader, and she's the author of the book Talking to Spirits. And she's going to give some insight about how she ended up being able to write a guidebook to how to become a medium yourself. And it's a lot more in depth than most of the experts will tell you. So you're really going to enjoy this. Plus, as you can imagine, she's seen a lot of ghosts. We're really thrilled to bring on Sterling here in a minute. Before we bring on Sterling, though, Diana, I would love to tell you about what I did this past weekend. Oh, what'd you do this past weekend, Becky? I flew to Chicago. And for those of you that are in Chicago and wondering why I didn't visit you, it was strictly an in and out trip. Did not have time to do anything. Just flew in, took my kids to Millennium Park, went on a ghost tour, went to a wedding, and then flew out again. One of the cool things was that I did finally get to see Death Alley in Chicago. Right. And this is the alley in between the two buildings that caught fire. Where 600 people died. Where they locked the doors, so they had to jump out the upper window. Yeah, in the Nederlander Theater in Chicago. Yes, it was supposed to be an unburnable theater. We know how that goes. <laughs> we know how that goes. The theater couldn't catch fire, but the curtain could. And the humans could. <laughs> yes. And it is the reason this terrible fire is the reason why we have a lot of the fire codes that we have today, especially with theaters. Exits, not locking the doors, doors opening outward instead of inward. Mm fire escapes, being bolted to the building. That was another problem. People tried to go out the fire escapes and the fire escapes weren't bolted to the building. So they all went down because they were like, oh, we don't need these. They're they're just for show. We don't really need fire escapes. I like the lifeboats on the Titanic. It's just for show. So I did get to go down Death Alley and yes, it was creepy. And boy, I certainly felt some things. It was creepy. In our most recent newsletter I sent out, there is actually a photo of the stage door with the ghost light in Death Alley, still being used by the theater. You can check that out. If you're in Chicago, you can actually go and visit it yourself and see if you experience anything. For me, it was just mostly shivers, and I couldn't tell if it was internal or external, but it's definitely a frightening place. But... Aside from wandering through downtown Chicago at night, I had a really fun experience on the way there. And I thought you would love this, Diana, while I was still in the Atlanta airport. So I flew from Atlanta to Chicago. So still in the Atlanta airport, I go to the bathroom. I'm in the stall and I just kept hearing this. Meow, 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 meow. And then... And I'm like, oh, somebody's bringing their cat on the plane. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to get to listen to that for a whole flight. Well, it wasn't my flight. Atlanta's a big airport. Oh, good. (laughs) Unlike Tulsa. We have several gates. (laughs) (laughs) Tulsa Airport has multiple gates. How many terminals? Oh, two. (laughs) Oh, how cute. Atlanta's much bigger. (sighs) And so is Chicago. (laughs) I haven't gotten on the plane yet, and I don't think this person was going to O'Hare because I did not see them on the plane. But I came out of the stall, and there's a lady there, and I see the carrier. It's hard to see in. It's definitely kind of a mesh around the carrier so that the kitty can't see very much, and you can't see much of the kitty. But I hear the kitty. That's and good. And I'm like, I hear the meow, meow. And it was, a, it was a younger woman. She's probably in her 20s with the cat. And I said, oh, my God. <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> only younger women are foolish enough to fly with a cat. Yep. 
I'm like, wow, your cat True. is so well behaved. I am mean, just hearing a few little meows. I'm not hearing the deathly screaming that my cats would be doing. Oh, it was Kitty on drugs. Well, that's what I asked her. I was like, did you did you drug the cat? She's like, no, no, she loves to fly. And I'm like, oh, and the cat's like, yeah. just loving it. Right. And I said, wow, well, uh, that's awesome. And she's like, yeah, in fact, she uses the toilet. We just use the toilet. Aww. So she had that cat. She taken the cat out of the carrier and put the cat on the self-flushing toilet in the airport. And I'm just trying to envision this cat using the potty in an airport. <laughs> now that's an adventure cat that wouldn't just jet off of that potty the moment it started to self-flush and just hide right? forever. Wow, that's a good adventure cat. Yeah, I was amazed. I did hear that. But I'm like, maybe the cat was uh, not happy about having to go back in its carrier after a wind pee. I I was going to say, that's when she put it back in its box. (laughs) It was perfectly fine up until I don't want to go back in my box. That's all I could think about, though, is like, I cannot wait to tell Diana about the cat that was peeing (laughs) in the airport bathroom. That's so cool. (laughs) I'm just surprised you can train a cat, period. I don't think you can. Like, I'm sure that cat made the active decision that it wanted to be a toilet trained adventure cat. This is true. Training a cat is a little bit more like it's a contractual compromise. Like, oh, (laughs) you want to go out with me? You have to learn how to use public potties. You want to leave the house? Oh, you have to learn how to walk on a leash. And there are cats that are willing to compromise and there are cats that aren't. I just thought that you would find that amusing. So next time you're in an airport, listen for the And if you hear it while you're in the bathroom, ask if the cat used the potty. Because maybe it did. (laughs) That's so cool. <laughs> well, now that we've talked about how you can train your adventure cat to use the self-flushing toilet in an airport, let's talk about psychics. On our Patreon this week, we want to give an announcement. Tomorrow, actually on Tuesday, the 25th, we are going to be doing a live dream interpretation. Last week, yes. we talked a lot about nightmares and horror movies and all of those yummy things. So Diana, who is professionally trained in dream interpretation, will I be am. interpreting our patron's dream. So if you're a patron... Go check that out. If you're not a patron, you can always sign up at patreon.com slash homespun hates. And if you're not a patron, enjoy this commercial. Today on the show, we are delighted to have Sterling Moon. She is the author of the book Talking to Spirits. She is also a tarot reader and a psychic medium. I would assume that's how you would identify yourself. Reluctantly, yes. (laughs) (laughs) And as you can imagine, she has some very, very spooky and ghostly stories to share with you today. So Sterling, thank you so much for being on the show today. It is a delight to meet you. I've been reading your book and it is fabulous. It is absolutely fascinating. I really love how actionable that you lay forth. It's told with love. The story is definitely told in a kind and gentle way, but it's also like, hey, try this. Step one, step two, step three, which is something that I love. I love that. I don't want to just be told to go meditate in a forest if I want to see ghosts. I want to be told how to create an altar for my ancestors and how to visualize a mind room and all of those really, really cool things that you include in the book. So thank you so much, Sterling, for being with us. Tell us a little bit about the book. Oh my gosh. Well, first of all, thank you. And second, that that means a lot because that was exactly what I set out to write because my process of figuring out what to do with these gifts, which for me, I've been pretty sensitive my whole life, but I had the blessing of having a little boy almost seven years ago. And there's something about that experience that just kind of cracked everything open. And I was left trying to figure out like what to do with all of this. And And my process of 
that was pretty sloppy, <laughs> to be honest. And there wasn't a lot of resources. And so my goal was to write the book that I wish I had had. And the resulting book is, I kind of joke that it's like the stereo instruction manual of mediumship. I had a background as a technical writer. Oh. Mm. <laughs> I worked for 20 years as a victim advocate. And towards the end of that, I was like a supervisor. I was writing a lot of grants. And so you kind of have to like tell the story in a very linear way. That's a little bit of the background too of how the book came out. But other than that, I mean, I'm a work in medium and I have been doing this work professionally. It started with tarot reading. I started that in 2013. So my business is Sterling Moon Tarot is 10 years old, but I am a boots on the ground, work in medium. This is my full-time job. I hope that that also comes through in the book, that it's it's hard-won lessons that I want other people to benefit from. Well, I'm so glad that you wrote it. It's an awesome book. And that book is Talking to Spirits. Is that the full title or is there a colon after that? It's a little long. It's Talking to Spirits, A Modern Medium's Practical Advice for Spirit Communication. And that is published by Llewellyn Books, and it's available on your website, correct? Yeah, I have some links on my website, and I'm fortunate to be, you can pick it up in a lot of little independent botanicas and metaphysical stores, but it's also available through the big dogs like Amazon or Barnes & Noble or directly through Llewellyn or bookshop.org too, if you also want to get it from a big online retailer that also supports local businesses. And we'll include links to all of that on our website if you are curious about talking to spirits or you are seeing and sensing things and you want to know a way to better clarify what's going on, this is a book you need to read. It really is, like you said, the instruction manual. (laughs) It doesn't read like an instruction manual. I need to put that out there. It reads so well. (laughs) It's fabulous. Thank you so much. You started out with tarot, as a lot of us do. That seems to be kind of the gateway drug for a lot of us. Totally. Do you use tarot to also talk to spirits? Is there any crossover there or any link? or is it more of just tuning into your intuition and psychic abilities when you do tarot? It's funny because I have a little podcast where the whole point of it was I wanted to have an excuse to bring my friends together because I know some (laughs) really interesting people doing this work. And I was like, I want to bring them on, talk about what they do. And it's like an excuse to hang out. So that's called a magical world. And as I've been talking with a lot of my friends who also read tarot, I'm like, wait, the way that you do this is really different than the way that I do this. And this is kind of where I go back to that. I'm a reluctant psychic medium. Like that term, it feels like so dated and I have like these like negative connotations with it. But it's really like the words that describe who I am and what I do. So the way that tarot works for me is I primarily use spirit communication with that because I believe that there's kind of two levels of information we can get from tarot. Sometimes it's that deep inner knowing. And that's using tarot as that self-reflective tool. And then there's also using tarot to maybe, and this is how I use it with my clients, is call to their highest spiritual guides and their highest selves. And it's the way of getting that 30,000 foot view of what is going on in our lives. Because we can get really mired down in the BS. We can get really lost in the weeds and the story of what's going on in our lives and what we think needs to happen. But then sometimes you tap into a spirit guide or that, again, your highest and best, most evolved self that's like, yeah, actually, you're trying to do all these mental gymnastics to convince yourself that this relationship is going to (laughs) work and this person is not good for you. So it took me a long time to get there. And when I started getting really busy as like just a work in tarot reader, I I was reading in a metaphysical shop where now I rent an office called Ritual Craft. And I was getting pretty busy. And I was just like noticing that everybody that came in seemed to come in with something different. And sometimes it felt like there were spirits coming in with these people that were like hanging over my shoulders and saying, like, tell them this, tapping the cards and say, tell them this. So yeah, it's been quite a process to like pick that apart and unbraid it. But Spirit communication is a big part of how I read tarot, it turns out. Wow, that is really, really cool. Diana and I have talked, not necessarily on the air, but at length with each other, if you can actually communicate with spirits through tarot, because she's like, how do you know who you're talking to? Is it like using a Ouija board? Could they be lying? Or maybe you're not really tapping in. How do you know? But it sounds like you have that intuition where you know who's talking to you in a way. Well, some of it has to do with the grounding and the setup, which I talk a little bit about in the book. I used to just like, okay, let's sit down and just start pulling cards. For me now, there's a process of intentionally grounding 
casting protected space, calling specifically to who we want to talk to, feeling it out as those spirits come in. And sometimes you do get ones where you're like, "Uh uh-uh, you're saying that you're a guide, but something feels off. And why is the client suddenly feeling nauseous Mm -hmm. or has a headache? And you kind of have to press pause and take a look. And if something doesn't feel right, you cast it away. Intuition is part of it, but it's also like, I'm a big believer that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure with this stuff because you never really know who you're talking to. You always run the risk with that. But as you get more practiced and skilled, your gut gets pretty accurate too. (laughs) Let's talk a little bit about some of your experiences. I know that you said it was very messy in the beginning. I gather that you had some senses about what was going on, but you said there was this like explosion when you gave birth to your son. Mm -hmm. What was that like? And what sort of things started happening? Oh, boy. So my son, he's an Aries. He's full classic Aries. He's always on the go. He has just never liked to sleep. And so I was very, very tired. My husband and I were just exhausted with this fussy little newborn. So the combination of adjusting to this huge life change, not enough sleep, and then suddenly I'm realizing I'm going places and I just am catching those shadows out of the corner of my eye. And I'm like, am I just tired? And like seeing, you know, shadow people that just maybe aren't there? Or is that, but huh, suddenly I'm realizing this is happening a lot. Or I'm hearing these voices, hearing these little quick bits of messages, and they feel real. Or sometimes I'm getting these messages, and they end up being something that is fully accurate. And some of this had even started while I was pregnant. And then I start realizing I'm having experiences where little things are moving. None of them were like big, momentous, movie-worthy experiences but enough of these things where I'm like, okay, I'm okay. I just need to learn how to deal with this. And then that kind of kicked off a whole series of fantastic and wondrous events. I was starting to study magic. I was starting to work with a really wonderful teacher named Danielle Battagione, who had a mystery school called Lapis Moon. And so that was also giving me the opportunity to play around with like rituals and ceremonies. I had the opportunity to start reading. I was a house reader for Ritual Craft, the shop that I mentioned earlier. And that was really fun because like I'm a brand new mom and this gave me something that was just like just my own and I'm meeting all these cool people, learning all this cool stuff. And then Ritual Craft ended up moving into this huge, beautiful space and the land of it had at one point been a carnation farm. It used to be farmland, but now it's all built up. And there were these huge greenhouses in the back. Everybody said that there was something back there. People have seen like full body apparitions of like people that will walk in and they look real, but then you look away and you look back and they're gone. I'm starting to have all these spooky experiences and I really need practice because I was busy, but every free moment that I had, I was exploring haunted locations. I was being pretty rude. I mean, I'm like mentally hollering, like, I know you can hear me, show yourself. I want to see you. You come talk to me. This one time, there's one in particular, I'll tell you where I got into real trouble and had to get my mentor to help me. But I remember asking if I could go practice in the greenhouses. And so I go into the back and I'm doing my like, I want to know who's here. There were a few psychic things that I got. Like I got this image of a woman who was dead. She was contorted. And a lot of us had felt the spirit of a child back there. And I just kept getting the sense that there was this little kid that felt like he couldn't leave because mom might have still been there. It was sad. It was a sad experience. That has since dissipated. But I do remember I'm kind of having this experience and I look over and this is one of a handful of times that I'm aware of that I've seen something with my eyes. I see this figure of what looks like a man, but it looked like it was made almost out of like beeswax. It was lumpy and it was full size, full size person, solid, and just walking, just walking with purpose. It probably was only three seconds and then it just disappeared. And I was like, oh oh shit, (laughs) oh shit, what in the world is happening here? That was fascinating because I'm like, okay, I'm on to something. Because when you see something with your eyes, there's one other time that I remember I was living in Duluth, Minnesota, and we lived out on what's called Arrowhead Road. And there was this little rural road. So that was a very, very busy road. But if you went across the street, there was kind of this back area that was very woodsy. And I was new in town and I had no idea what was on the other side, but I would walk my dog. And I remember this one time 
seeing this man come from where the road ended, which I found out later was the back end to the old jail. And I remember seeing this man, he was in full Navy dress blues, like the white hat. I could see all of the bars glinting in the sun and the gloves. I just remember, and this was like seven in the morning. And I see this man, and again, he's walking, what reminded me of is the walking with purpose. And he's coming at me fast. And I just had that moment of like, this isn't right. And I was terrified. Part of me was like, I don't want to meet this, like, what the hell is this person doing out here? He might not be stable. So I just ran home with my dog and I'm peering out the window waiting to see when this person is going to come out because I knew all my neighbors. And I was like, there's this person is not maybe they were like a weird son or cousin or whatever that was visiting. No one ever came out. And so I've always wondered, was that a real person or was that something spooky? But anyway, so this was like, that was the last time I remember seeing something like this. But later on, around that same time, I'm just like farting around. I'm just doing all this wild stuff. Shortly after I had had my experience with the weird beeswax, beeswax man, (laughs) I ended up deciding I'm going to go to this notoriously haunted park. So in Colorado, in Denver, we have this park called Cheeseman Park. Cheeseman used to be an old cemetery. And a little bit of the history with this park is it had been a cemetery. And then the city decided that this was prime real estate and they wanted to put a beautiful park for the community to enjoy there. And so they hired a guy named E.P. McGovern. And they hired him to dig up the bodies. Of course, they notified people and said, you have to come claim your loved ones within 90 days. Or what? (laughs) Right? (laughs) This is where we're again. Or E.P. McGovern was going to move them for you. And we also know, too, there's people that don't get claimed, right? There's the potter's fields. So anyway, E.P. McGovern comes in. He was not a good person. He was getting paid by the coffin. So he was dismembering bodies and putting them into child-sized coffins so he could charge more. And there was a newspaper called, the, I believe it was the Denver Republic, if memory serves. And they broke the story instead of making it right. Like he doubles down and ends up like kind of finishing things up. But he leaves these open graves because he said his contract didn't include filling them. And the city, instead of taking time to make sure all this is done right, at a certain point, they leave the remaining bodies and they plant trees in the open (laughs) graves and call it good and open the park on schedule. We have in the center of town, this glorious park called Cheeseman Park. The Denver Botanical Gardens butts up against it. And to this day, people are still finding human bones. Like I think it was either last year or the year before someone found an arm bone in the Japanese garden at the botanical gardens like <laughs> and so that whole area is unbelievably haunted well, yeah. and so my <laughs> clever self decides that I'm going to go and just experiment and I had my dog with me at the time and at this point I wasn't doing any grounding I wasn't doing cleansing after I was done I was just winging it playing it fast and loose and so I go and it's a hot September day and I am just doing my mental hollering saying I know you can hear me I want to see you let's let's do this let's have a conversation I get nothing thing. And I'm kind of looking for cold spots and things like that. And at a certain point, I start feeling really swimmy and sick. And I just chalk it up to, oh, it's just a really hot day. But I go home. And within two days, I knew something was wrong. I was just not feeling good. What what really gets me is I had a baby at home. My husband is there. I didn't do anything to cleanse. I didn't protect my dog. It was like a few days after I had done all this. I'm pulling down some devotional oil that I had made in honor of my grandmother. It was like something that I would wear when my confidence was feeling a little bit low. It took months to make. And I'm holding it and just something slams it out of my hand. And it goes all over. I'm trying to convince myself. I'm like, your hands are oily. It must have slipped. But I'm like, I know what I saw. I watched it go. And then it was the next night or very early the next morning, around three or four in the morning, I wake up from a nightmare and I am trying to go back to sleep. And when I'm right in between that space between waking and sleeping, I hear just this rage filled man scream. But it's like in my head. And I'm like, okay, 
Sterling, you're, you're, you're getting away from yourself. But then I hear my son start whimpering <gasps> on the baby monitor. Oh, no. And that when I was like, oh, no, this is not good. And so I contact Danielle, my mentor. And I had talked with a couple of spiritual workers. And I contacted a root worker, Professor Charles Porterfield. I had the opportunity to ask Professor Porterfield what I should do. And he gave me some very helpful tips, but it just didn't fully cleanse it out. And so I contacted Danielle. She helped me get rid of this. She's like, you brought home something and she was the first person who said these are gifts and you need to treat them with more reverence and so that was the ultimate turning point of how I started conducting myself and when I really started investing in my studies you mess around you find out mess around you find out (laughs) turns out how did you end up dealing with this entity that attached to you and was affecting your baby So she ended up doing it for me. She's also a medium. And so she went through her process of literally removing the spirit that was latched onto me, which happens, happens to a lot of, you know, sometimes it happens in little ways where just regular spiritual hygiene and cleansing can take care of that for you. But this was one where she, she kind of did her work and she took care of it for me. Would the right word for that be exorcism? Nah, I mean, I think it's more, yeah, I guess some people would call it an exorcism, but removal, that comes with so much, that's such a loaded word. I know, <laughs> I didn't even want to say it. Yeah, and also too, that is like a very, that's a specific process, that's a specific cultural and religious process. It was removal of a spirit attachment, which some people might call an exorcist, but it wasn't, I feel like that's almost like a trademarked term <laughs> from the Catholic Church. <laughs> the Catholic Church for a while was starting to train non-clergy on how to do this, and I totally looked into it. I was like, I want to learn how to do this. And then the first thing they had was the explosion of witchcraft and terror readers and occultists is responsible for the prevalence of demons. I was like, I don't think I would be accepted. (laughs) (laughs) Does your book outline how to do cleansings and things? A little. Yes. It stops like how to remove negative entities. It stops for a reason because there are some things that you do need to have a little bit more experience. But Most of the things, like you're doing regular spiritual cleansing of your house, you're doing regular spiritual cleansing of yourself, you're doing some regular protection for your home and yourself, that'll take care of most things. Sometimes like real malevolent stuff, you really do need to talk to somebody that has a bit more knowledge and experience. Sometimes you just got to ask an expert, which is how the book ends. So of like how to find an ethical spiritual worker when you get in over your head. You mentioned before we began that you had some stories that were sweet, you had a love story, and you also have some more scary stories to share. Which one do you want first? Ooh, let's start with scary. Okay. I will tell you about the scariest place that I have ever lived in my life. This went from 2010 to 2012. And it was when my husband and I had moved to Denver. We met in Wyoming. I'm from all over the West. I was born in Colorado, lived in New Mexico, Wyoming. We spent four years in Minnesota so I could get a master's degree. But we moved into this townhouse. For folks who are maybe familiar with Denver, it is in the Baker neighborhood, which is two miles south of downtown. Town. Baker is this beautiful historic neighborhood filled with like old Victorian homes. We were, however, living in this crappy townhouse. It was a row home and they were probably built in like the 70s or 80s. And it did not look like it should have been a place that would have been haunted, but it was one of the most scary places I've ever been. Shortly after moving in, I started noticing that I just felt really uncomfortable when I would be upstairs where our bedrooms were. I'd be washing my face and just feeling like, oh my God, if I look up and I look in the mirror, there's going to be someone there. Oh, like yeah. Just awful feeling. I would wake up in the night to these flashing lights in front of my face and it would be cold, cold, cold. And there would just be, again, that oppressive feeling like someone who hates me is in this room. Bedrooms were on the third floor. Main floor was okay. It was actually pretty cozy and cute and bright, but then you'd go in the basement. We would have Things would go flying off of shelves. Things would get broken down there all the time. I will say on the main floor, we had just unabated bug infestations. And, you know, we don't have cockroaches really here. I mean, it's so dry and arid. This place, we could never, ever get rid of the cockroaches. They were everywhere. We had broken pipes that just didn't make any sense. And in the basement, too, we had this mysterious beeping. And it sounded like when a smoke alarm, like when the battery is going dead, but there was nothing in our 
basement. I talked to the neighbors on both sides. Even when both of those units were vacant at different points, we would hear it and the sound would kind of move. You couldn't really tell where it was coming from. And that continued until we moved out. We never figured out what that was. It was almost like a mimic kind of a sound. The other thing that was hard was that not only are we having these lights and this cold and this oppressive feeling, the dreams there were horrible. Dreams about violence and always about conflict with people that you cared about. It just was awful, but I didn't say a word because my husband was pretty skeptical at the time. And when you're sensitive, you get told you're sensitive and oh, you're too sensitive and oh, you're, you've got such an imagination and blah, blah, blah. So my husband was doing data cabling and he went out of town for a job for about a week and it was just awful. He comes back and I broke down and I told him everything. When I started talking about the lights, he says, wait, you see them too? And he knows I tell the story. Poor guy. He had it worse than I did because he was also waking up to hearing someone whispering in his ear wordlessly at times. And people would come and stay with us. They would have the bad dreams. They would hear people walking upstairs. Mm. And of course, we'd always be like, oh, is it our neighbors? Like we kind of had some trashy neighbors that like to party. And so sometimes it was like, okay, are they just doing their thing at three in the morning? Because that's what they do. But other times it was like, no, this is somebody walking upstairs and there's nobody walking walking upstairs. So I ended up going to a local metaphysical store at a certain point and asking, there was a woman that I talked to there and she said that she did, I think the wording that she used was like pro bono spirit rescue, which is kind of not my thing, these, you know, whatever. But she was very, very nice. And she came to the house and she picked up, she said that the spirit that was causing the dreams and the cold and all of that wasn't there that felt accurate because sometimes it felt like it would go away but then it'd come back and she's like i would bet you that your other neighbors and other people on this block probably experienced that it was somebody who comes and goes and she got the sense of somebody who might have been homeless who maybe had substance abuse problems and maybe had even died from freezing to death and that part of town used to be really rough like really really rough and she was from out of state and so she didn't know about the history of that part of town so that felt kind of valid and then she told us what was in the basement and at the time this really pushed the bounds of what I was comfortable with she's like yeah you've got a trapped earth spirit in the basement and that's causing the pipes the bugs and the things flying off the the shelves. And I'm like, what is a trapped earth spirit? She's like, you know, it's kind of like a troll. And I'm like, "Mm mm-hmm, okay. Now I carry regret because I didn't take the steps that she recommended for this trapped earth spirit, which was to basically build it a spirit house. And I still wish I had done that because that might've helped because I feel sorry for, I don't feel sorry for the man that was coming and going out of our house, but I do feel sorry if there was something that maybe had lived in a tree that was torn down to make way for the development. Because I do now, I do believe in that. So we ended up moving. We were lucky enough to buy a house exactly one mile down the same street. And that first night we were in our new house, I woke up to the lights in the cold exactly one time, one time only. Never happened again. That was the scariest place that I have ever lived. And that was two years of our life. Ooh, that's terrifying. Wow. You mentioned the term mimic sound. Can you go into what you mean by that? Yeah, so sometimes there are spirits, and I don't know why, I don't know if there are specific spirits that will do this, but sometimes there are spirits that a way that they will kind of get your attention is they like to mimic noises. So sometimes it'll be you hear your name and it sounds like somebody that you know, but there's nobody home. That is something that sounds like it's a fairly common Mm -hmm. phenomena. Yep. Yeah, Becky, share the violin story real quick. I don't know, maybe it's something with the harmonics, but I lived in a new build when I was a teenager in East Tennessee, which for some reason was haunted. I know that happens. You can have a haunted new build. Oh, yes, you can. (laughs) And we built it ourselves. Every time I would play my violin in my bedroom, this didn't happen anywhere else in the house, I would hear my mom call my name. And I would run out, even when she wasn't even in the house, every time I would run out and be like, "What, what do you want? I didn't call you. And this happened enough. There would be times where she would call me and I would just ignore it because like, oh, it's just the noise. Well, my daughter is experiencing the same thing now when she practices her violin in her room. And also when she practices her guitar, she'll come out constantly. What? What do you want? I'm like, it wasn't me. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah. 
Oh, that is fascinating. <laughs> also, in your story, you also mentioned the term spirit house. Not everybody may be familiar with that. Can you give us a little backstory there? Absolutely. So they're found in a lot of different cultures. It's the idea that if you have a spirit that is looking for a place to stay, a lot of the lore around spirit houses is associated with earth spirits okay. who maybe they need like a space, especially if maybe their original home was destroyed. If you have spirits that were attached or they lived within a boulder or within this body of earth that was excavated or tree spirits, that one of the things that you can do to give them a space to go is create, I mean, sometimes it can be as simple as a bottle or a box. And again, this is where some of the woo and the imagination and directing your energy that this is not just a container, it has the capacity to be a home for a spirit that needs a physical space. And sometimes that same principle can work with spirits of the human dead as well. So a spirit house is not necessarily trapping anything or keeping it there. Oh. It's simply like a birdhouse. Yeah, exactly. I think we have time for maybe one more story. I'll let you choose what you would like to tell us. I will tell you a sweet one that I've never told before. Oh. And this is about a haunted bar and a very intoxicated woman who I'm 90% sure was ridden by a spirit and convinced me to tell my husband that I loved him for the first time. In Laramie, Wyoming, we have a bar called the Buckhorn Bar. Now, the Buckhorn is a place that opens at six in the morning. And part of it is because we got the cement plant in town. When the workers get off on the overnight shift, they need a place to go, as do our folks that they've gotten a bit lost in the sauce. At that time, I was working at a coffee shop down the alley. I'd gone through a pretty significant breakup. My father had died. I was supposed to move to Athens, Georgia with my boyfriend in a band. And I made different choices and was really just kind of getting my life together. In my teenage years, I had been deeply in love with a man. We ended up dating for a couple of years. It ended badly because we both had some problems and needed to get our acts together. So we hadn't spoken for about five years. I was at work and I was closing up the coffee shop and one of my coworkers had come in really bummed out because he had found out that someone that he really cared about had died in a, just a, a horrible freak accident. And it ended up being somebody that I knew was one of my now husband's best friends. I had felt just devastated for this former boyfriend that we had been estranged and hadn't been in touch. And I was like, gosh, I really hope that he's okay. I walked down the alley to the Buckhorn and it turns out that the funeral had been that day and all of this man's friends had come down to the bar to honor him and drink. And I, the first person I see is the man who I am now married to. I remember just having that moment of feeling like everything fell away, all the resentments. And I just said, can I buy you a beer? I'm so sorry. And from there, we just reconnected. The friendship came first. But the Buckhorn is one of those places where if you talk to spiritually inclined people, they will tell you that place is a portal. It is haunted as hell. It's incredibly old. There's bullet holes in the, the big mirror behind the bar. Ooh. Some of them are recent. <laughs> There's something called the parlor that's upstairs. That was a brothel at one point. There are bottles of liquor that are hung up high on the walls amongst dead animal heads. And the bottles are people who died. That was their last bottle that they had their last drink from before they passed. Mm. And so there's a lot of charged things in this place. Sometimes you'll go there and you'll have these experiences. The night of reconnecting with my now husband, it was a powerful night. Flash forward months later, I'm dragging this poor guy along. I'm just like not ready to hunker down. I'm not ready to like go back in time. I'm still trying to figure my way out. But he asked me, hey, will you go to the see this band with me? And I'm like, all right. So I go down to the Buckhorn and I'm there. And there's this little tiny woman that I've never seen before. And she is out of her mind. We have a, we got a bit of a meth problem in Wyoming. I would bet my bottom dollar that she was drunk as a skunk and probably on some meth. But she's just like not there. She's just bopping around and she has this red bandana tied around her head. And at one point she comes up to me and grabs me around the waist. And I'm like, okay, you know, which happens at the bar sometimes, right? It's like, I'm like, okay, sweetie, you know, hey, how's it going? <laughs> and she looks at me and her face begins to change. And then she moves her arm up and grabs me around the neck and pulls me close. And her voice gets very deep and clear. And she says to me, why won't you tell him that you love him? Can't you see that he loves you? Look at him. How long are you gonna let this go? And just like that, it's over. And I'm shaken. 
I'm like shaking in my boots. And I'm looking at this man and I'm just like going, oh my God, what in, what in the world just happened? I ended up telling my now husband, I'm like, I'm going to go home, but I'd like to talk with you tomorrow. And as I'm leaving, I walk out the door and the thing that I see is her red bandana. And so I picked that up. I brought it home. Sadly, I've lost it now. But within a few weeks, I finally screwed up my courage and told this man that I loved him. And we've been together ever since. Oh, I love that. This sounds like a magical place. Sterling, this has been a wonderful conversation. You are such a delight to talk to. Absolutely. You have so many wonderful so stories. You. And this has been great. It's so nice to meet the author after reading the book. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Y'all have been listening to Sterling Moon, who is the author of Talking to Spirits. She is also a tarot reader. You can find her at sterlingmoontarot.com. And people can book readings with you, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, you can book readings, take classes. I'm a busy lady and you can find all of it on my website, though. (laughs) And we will also have links to all of these things, as well as social handles. You're on Facebook and Instagram. Are there other social platforms you'd like people to follow you on? It's best if you sign up for my email list because I will share blog posts and YouTube videos occasionally, but those are usually unlisted. I'm a little shy sometimes with some of that stuff. And so if you sign up for my email list, you get all the goodies though. Cool. All right. And people can sign up through your website. This has been fabulous. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. And listeners, do you play in a park built on dead bodies that rise from the ground occasionally? Or have you been approached by a meth addict who tells you about your one true love? I don't know, but if you do, you'll probably have a spooky day. Homespun Haints is hosted by Becky Kielimnik and Diana Doty and produced by Homespun Haints Media LLC. Editing and music by Becky Kielimnik. Show notes by Diana Doty. If you have a ghost story and you'd like to be considered as a guest for this podcast, please visit our website at homespunhaints.com slash submit.